Hi. Hey. What up? How's it going? Welcome. My name's Taryn. And I'm Tate. And this is Plant That Sis Podcast. Welcome. How's everybody doing? How's it going? How is life? We hope you're hanging in there, getting all your holiday stuff done. Yep, enjoying the happiest time of the year, apparently. The most wonderful, right? The most wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and stressful. And expensive. Speaking yep. of expensive, this episode is all about how to not break the bank on your plants. I am sure most of you guys that are listening to this already know the life we live, but the plant hobby becomes really pricey really fast. And yep. today we just want to share with you guys our tips. You know, there's plenty out there, but our tips of how we've tried to manage that a little bit and keep our house plants happy without breaking the bank. Yep. And just, just a disclaimer, we're not hating on rare plant lovers. I mean, we all love rare plants. No shame if you have a beautiful Thai constellation monstera or a philodendron Birkin. Shit, girl. I butchered <laughs> Philodendron the Birkin. Philodendron. Okay, these, these these names, they get to my brain a little bit. Um, but, you know, we love you guys. We live vicariously through you. And I'm sure you love these penny-pinching tips so you can buy more of your expensive and rare plants. Yes. By no means is this an episode hating on expensive plants or expensive things for plants. We want to be you. We just can't. <laughs> we yeah. ain't got the funds in the bank to be you. So, And if you can buy some plants cheap and, you know, have these tips, why not just grow your collection at the same time, you know? Yeah. At the end of the day, everybody needs some filler. Yep. Gotta have some filler. Exactly. Plants. One way that I know I must still be truly a beginner at the end of the day, even though I feel like I'm getting better, I think I'm still a beginner because I just am not confident enough to buy super expensive plants. I see them and I'll get excited and I just know if I drop 60 bucks to buy this cutting that I'm going to bring to life and I don't bring it to life, I will be kicking myself later. And you're like 60 bucks gone. <laughs> yep. Just threw it out the window. Great. Well, and it's really easy when you're looking at a plant and you see the price tag, but you're like, okay, but like, if I can just make but it... But look at it. But look at it and it's just going to grow. It's going to get bigger. It's going to be great. And then, yeah, I don't know. You get like the uh, the stars in your eyes and you don't think about like how much work it might take to take care of it or even if you have like the space for it or whatever it needs. That's my problem at least. So some plants that ended up being more difficult than we thought in one way, shape, or form. There's different ways that that category has kind of happened for us, I think, especially between the two of us. Some, like we've already kind of talked about, we just saw and got excited about and didn't do the research and planning and conditions and all that good stuff. Bought it, didn't give it what it needed, so it died. Some of them are just, we don't have the right conditions for. Again, I know we've kind of mentioned we live in Texas, so we have some extreme weather changes all very close together, and it gets really hot here a lot of the time. So some of these we've got that we have got in the past just don't fit where we live. And some of them, for whatever reason, I know we've said this before too, but sometimes you and that plant just aren't going to get along. Yep. It's just not, it just didn't happen for undetermined reasons. And that's the most frustrating part. <laughs> and those sometimes stick with you. Oh, yeah. It's so ridiculous. It's like... Trauma. Yes. Trauma and then for whatever reason, every time you get that plant, you're like, here we go again. Or you see it in the store and you're like, uh-uh, no, don't uh -uh. do it. I've, I have learned my lesson with that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so some of the plants I feel like I've struggled with or I've lost are <laughs> Alocasia Polly. I know we all know her. She's the beautiful. I know she's a hybrid between some kind of elephant's ear and probably another kind. I don't know exactly what. When we do a whole episode, when I can keep that plant alive, then we'll do a whole episode on oh, it yeah. and I can give you deets. <laughs> They're very aesthetic. Like they have oh a cool my god, aesthetic. So cool. Yes. I'm a sucker for any plant that has super dark or black leaves in general. So saw this one. It wasn't super expensive. I want to say I spent probably $20 on it 
ordered it online, came in. I had it probably for a month and just watched it slowly die. <laughs> Same kind of thing is happening currently with my Stromanthe Trio Star, however you say that. I know Tate mentioned that's going pretty successfully for her, and it I is. am jealous because mine is just withering so slowly and painfully away. Another one, Calathea Freddy. I've had a couple other. I got a white fusion. That was an embarrassing purchase. Why I thought I would <laughs> that was going to work, I don't know. It literally, I ordered it online. It didn't do great in the mail. It was okay when I got it, and then it died within two weeks. Oh, man. So that was stupid and embarrassing. I wonder if the mail had anything to do with it. Like, I feel like some plants probably just, just can't travel well, and that's probably why. So maybe, you know, you don't have to be so embarrassed. Yeah, I like that we'll idea. Just, we'll just blame it on the mail. <laughs> It's all the U.S. Postal Service's fault. (laughs) Another embarrassing one for me, another one that is an embarrassing loss, is Fetonia. I know this is a basic houseplant a lot of people have, but again, didn't work for me. Had it for a couple weeks, and this one was a cheap, uh, you know, big box store purchase, and it just didn't last. And then another one I have, you know, I've had some trouble with peperomias. I know people love them, but for some reason I have had issues with them, particularly the wrinkled leaf variety. I don't know. I've had a couple different kinds. I don't know exactly what they were, but... It's funny you say that because I'm actually having a problem with one of my peperomias literally right now. I don't know what's wrong with it. It's its leaves like are curling like towards mm-hmm. the center. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't really know. Yes. The one you gave me? Yeah, it's that, that same kind. Yes, that mine that you gave me is doing the same thing. Maybe Weird. we'll have to do a little, we'll have to do a little ep- episode on that one. Yeah, we might have to. Since we both have it, a deep dive, a deep dive. <laughs> that's right, down the rabbit hole. <clears throat> so I think for me, obviously, the theme is the humidity. I just refuse to buy a humidifier. Call me what you want. I just can't do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to deal with the mold in the actual thing. Yeah. So I think that's kind of my my biggest issue. Yeah. So I kind of have an opposite problem. So I moved recently. So I'm now in a place where I get a lot more sunlight. So my plants are, you know, a lot more happy. But before and for most of my plant journey so far, I've lived in kind of low light apartments that don't really get a lot of sun. So I would get, you know, a lot of succulents and they just would never really do well. I don't really know why. I just suck at succulents. I suck at them. I cannot (laughs) keep them alive. They get so long and then I put them more sun and then they burn. And then I'm like, what the heck do you want from me? Mm. I don't know. I just, I feel like I'm cursed. Like I cannot, I cannot get succulents right for some reason. So like I'll buy a bunch of them, you know, because you can get them pretty cheap. Yeah. And, um. Yeah, so I've, I've wasted a lot of money on those, yeah. especially because you can just <laughs> propagate them. Ugh, whatever. Yes. Yeah, it's been a whole well, thing. Well, they're always cute. They're, they're oh my God, yeah, they look so cute. super I attractive. <laughs> I love them. And, you know, honestly, since I have moved to my new place where I get more sun, they are a bit more happy. Like, um, we talked about our grandma a couple times before on this, on this podcast. Little Grammy, yep. She gave me some of hers. She has a huge, like colony of ghost plants like those succulents that are kind of like light blue they can be purple in some light she has a ton of those she just cut some it's off a rosette like, style yeah rosette style thank you mm-hmm. um she just cut some of those off and gave me some and they've been doing great and i'm convinced mm-hmm. it's because she gave them to me yeah <laughs> probably yeah she has an insane in her flower bed it's just this whole section and it's like Tate said, a swarm of those. They're just like literally a colony incessantly growing over each other. It is so beautiful. I love it. And I, she gave us, she's just like, here, go for it. So we just chopped a whole bunch off and took some. And I put, I put a couple in containers and they didn't do as well, but I did stick some. I have this really, really narrow, just part of a flower bed next to my house and I stuck them in there and they actually are doing great. Even though we've had a couple of freezes, they're growing. Yeah, I've noticed that those ones are a little more hardy, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Maybe maybe it's because of where we live and they like the dry heat, you know, and it doesn't get yeah. that cold. It, it, it can freeze, but it doesn't get like that cold. But yeah, so just a lot of succulents in general. And I wish I knew the names of all these succulents, but you know when you go to the store and there, it's just like succulent mm-hmm. and it doesn't tell you like the name of them. So another one that I have... Um, struggled with and I kind of am regretting buying was okay I think it's normally called a corkscrew rush but 
when I bought it, it was called a Curly Whirly. So I'm calling it a Curly Whirly because that's a lot more fun. We were planning for this episode. I said, Curly Whirly, what in tarnation is that? I'm like, I was like, you know. She was like, that's what it's whirly, called. The plant, that's Curly. I don't know how else to explain I mean, it. The leaves <laughs> are long and they curl up. Maybe Corkscrew Rush is a better way to describe it because they are like little corkscrews, but I'm going to run with Curly Whirly. So just so y'all know, that's what I'm calling it. Well, and that's like the opposite of succulents, right? It is the, yeah, it is the exact opposite. It wants a lot of water. I think it's like a bog plant. So it, in the, in the wild where it's naturally from, it has a lot of moisture. So of course, you know, buying that in the heat of summer of tech in Texas, I was like, yeah, I'll water it like every day. I'll go check on it. I'll make sure it's doing really well. I like this plant. And then when it came to actually doing all that. I was like, uh, I would forget Whoops. sometimes. I'd go outside and I'd be like, holy crap, my curly whirly I forgot. So, well, and y'all have to remember Tate is a, she's a good, she's not an overwaterer like I am. Yeah, I have the exact opposite problem. Like, Taryn's a lot more organized and with it. And sometimes I can be a little lazy and a little forgetful of all my plants. So, that's just one of the ones that I, like, if I saw it again in the store, I would definitely be tempted, but I don't think I would get it again just because I'm, a little lazy. But if you're like Taryn, or if you're not lazy like me, it's a really cool plant. But I just, for me personally... Mine died too. It did? I had a curly whirly also. Well, I actually, I don't, it might still be alive. Maybe I could go just chop off all the dead stuff and try to revive it. But I, yeah. I my issue was I kept it really wet like I was supposed to, but then I was having fungus gnat issues. So I went and stuck it outside because I was like, no, 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 no. We can't be doing this in here. So I stuck it outside <laughs> and then I didn't water it enough outside. So Yeah, see, mine was outside. Maybe I should have brought it in, honestly, now that I think about it. Um, I, yeah, because mine has like one green curly left. <laughs> That's, it's got one. The I'm lone like, girl, strand. I'm girl. so sorry. But yeah, <laughs> I think it's still technically live. Maybe I could try to bring it back. I just kind of gave up, but whatever. And another one that I had was lavender. I, I saw it at the store and I was like, mm. I've always wanted lavender. And I talked about this before. Uh, but like I said earlier, I lived in a low light apartments and lavender needs a lot of light. And so I just, it got really leggy and it eventually just died. And I was like, what was I expecting? Like, I don't know what I was expecting with the lavender, but... Mm -hmm. yeah it smells so good though yeah, i had that God. same i had some french lavender i don't know what yes. the difference is but it was and it was amazing while it was alive and it died really fast yeah like we said earlier you know all of our problems and issues with these plants are kind of unique to us and like how we approach our plants and where we even live like in texas it's really hot but if you live somewhere where it rains a bunch and it's not that hot that curly whirly might be great outside you know what i mean <laughs> Going off of all of those plants that we didn't have a lot of success with in the past, plants that we would recommend as far as giving you the most bang for your buck, we're going to tell you now. I don't know why I said that backwards, but we're going to tell you right <laughs> now some plants that we, in our again, in our experience, everyone has different experience. None of these plants are indestructible. You can kill all of them, and I've probably killed most of them at least once, <laughs> but I figured it out and I've moved past it. So Yeah, and the most bang for your buck is really like the best part. So like the perfect example of that would be like a pothos. So we talked about this um, in our, one of our previous episodes, how they're really easy to grow. They're hardy. You know, they can take, they can tolerate low light. They don't necessarily like do great in low light, but they, they can grow in low light. They are fast growing. They're bushy. And what I like about them the most is that you can propagate them. So you can cut them and put them in water and let some roots grow out, and then put them in soil once the roots are developed, and then you have a whole other pothos that will grow. And you can just multiply them like that. Like, if you buy one or two, you should be set for a while, because you can just propagate them more, and I feel like that's, like, most bang for your buck right there. Well, and the thing about pothos, like Tate said, propagation, which we'll get to some other, you know, general tips on propagation and how that can help save you money, because you can make more of the plants you already have, but with pothos, too, you can also, once you root those cuttings, you can also stick it back in the same pot to fill it out a little bit more. Oh, so if yeah. You upsize, or if for whatever reason you've had a little bit of death, kind of, you know, it's yeah. looking a little sparse up around the top, especially as they grow. Sometimes it gets a little sparse up in the top. That's a good way to repot uh, 
those cuttings back into the same pot and it'll fill out your plant a little bit more. And that's the thing about pothos that I love the most is if you can get it going, it'll start growing really big and bushy and it'll have a big impact because it'll take over whatever space you give it if it's in, you know, if you give it the right conditions. The next one is peace lily. Again, I know we've talked about this, but same kind of thing. Anything to me that can do pretty decent in lower light conditions. Again, reminder, low light does not mean no light. It's more light than you think it needs, but in general, it can get pretty big while still being in those lower light conditions. And so I think that's a great one when you have that space, you kind of need to fill. There's obviously tons of low light options, but Peace Lily can get big and bushy. And especially if you're going for more of the jungle vibe with lots of big, beautiful foliage, that's a great plant to put in a certain spot. And the flowers are pretty. Yes, and they flower. It's yeah. kind of nice. Uh, they're little white flowers that'll pop up. So it's a super dark green foliage with little white flowers that'll pop up. It's pretty. Yeah, I feel like it can add a lot to the space. Because mm-hmm. sure. it'll get big. They don't stay. Yeah. They're not necessarily super compact plants. They can get big. Like mine that I have is I just have it sitting on the floor. Yeah. So it's big enough, if that makes sense. It's big enough to where it takes up a space and I don't have to have a... Because I'm sure you guys know the struggle of where are you going to put all the plants and when you need the layers and the levels, this is one that you can't, it gets big enough to where you don't need to have it on something. That's cool. I need more plants like that. (laughs) I'm kind of running out of like space to put plants on. Yeah, counter space. Yeah. Um, Another, you know, plant that we like here and, you know, this kind of could be more specific to our area, but, you know, cacti are usually pretty easy. They need a lot of direct sun, so if you have an area, like, outside, maybe, like, on the porch or in your backyard somewhere, even, like, by a really sunny window that gets a lot of sun, you can kind of put them directly in the window. Yeah. Like, I have mine. A lot of mine are just on the windowsill to get as much sun as possible. Uh, Mm -hmm. But they're pretty hardy. You know, they don't need a lot of water. If you just put them somewhere sunny, they usually are pretty good. Uh, And they're at least, like, slow to die. Unless you, like, overwater the crap out of it, then it might die pretty quickly. But, like... They're very tolerant to drought. So if you just kind of leave it there for a while and maybe leave it alone, you know, they look good. That's what can be kind of hard about cacti. I feel like it's they're they're not as vocal as some more foliage plants. Yeah. Um, so it's it is a little harder to tell sometimes, but the nice thing about it, the thing I think is a positive, like Tate said, they're kind of slow to die, so they don't it's unless you water the crap out of it, like Tate said, they're not going to it's not going to be a purchase that you make. And then you're already a month out. You're already throwing the plant away. It'll at least kind of hang tight in its spot for a while before things go really, really south. So, yeah, exactly. It, it's at least slow to die if you are killing it. <laughs> it's at least a little bit slower of a death so you can enjoy it for a little bit longer. Exactly. OK, this next one. I've loved, everyone loves, it's definitely a classic and it's very in right now, but mine is finally starting to really go and I'm starting to really see why people love this plant. It's the Raphidophora tetrasperma, and I think people call it mini monstera, um, but it's the more tropical, it's not just a plain leaf shape, it has... Uh, I don't know if it's called fenestration when it's cutouts rather than holes in the leaf, but has some uh, decorative fenestration. It looks super tropical. It's sort of like pothos in that it's a, a trailing vining plant. It does better, just like pothos, it does better climbing. If you give it somewhere to climb, its leaves will get bigger rather than smaller. If you let it trail, the leaves will get smaller and it won't grow as much. That's um, cool. But what I love about the Rifidophora tetrasperma, it gives you a tropical vibe without needing the high maintenance humidity, <clears throat> like the calatheas and some other really beautiful tropical plants. And they, it, once they get going, so I, I got mine and it was on a one of those little hoops. It just had one of those like bamboo hoops in oh, the okay. pot. So it was already growing up and I... Left it in there for a while. It did fine. It put out some new growth. Then I transferred it into LECA. So that's one of the plants I do have in LECA. And when I first transferred it, it took. it's kind of been a while. And it was growing and it looked happy, but it didn't. It wasn't really thriving, I wouldn't say. But probably within the last, I don't know, three weeks, maybe a month. O-M-G. It is popping. It is popping out new yes. leaves at least once a week. Oh, my God. I mean, it's finally getting going. I freaking love this plant. They look so cool. So trendy for right now. Yeah, very trendy. And it's one of those things, I really believe once you can get it going, probably like most plants, it's about figuring it out, right? But once you get it going, it'll really start popping out new growth. And 
again, like the pothos, it has aerial roots up those vines. And so you can take cuttings all along the vine and get all kinds of new plants from that same plant. So That's I can't nice. recommend this one enough. The next one I want to recommend is, again, I know we've talked about this one already, and this is a more recent purchase of mine, a String of Hearts, pretty basic. Uh, these definitely love sun. You've got to stick this in a super sunny spot. So kind of like the cacti, cacti we were talking about, it's going to want to be right in direct sun in the windows. I know sometimes people say they can get too much sun, but I would just say start with as much sun as you can give it. And if you need to pull back, it's super easy to do. Um, once they're starting to get all of that sun, they're, again, like a lot of these on our list, fast growers. And honestly, they give off such a damn vibe. They Anything trailing, of course, gives a vibe. But these little tiny hearts that can grow super, super long, you can put them in any size pot and it'll make a statement wherever you put it, especially in a hanging. But even if you don't have it in a hanging planter necessarily even if you have it up on a shelf or sitting on top of your piano or you know anywhere where it can trail off the side it's gonna give a statement wherever you put it so I definitely recommend that one yeah it can add a lot to a space I love how I love how any trailing plant looks so and it's a little different than a lot of trailing plants a lot of other trailing plants are very foliage heavy and since these are more of a succulent and they're real tiny it just gives a totally different look so it's a great way to diversify and then the last one on our list is chinese evergreen so there's a ton of different types of chinese evergreens or cultivars i guess you could say whatever the right word is um and it's similar to a peace lily in that they are they can get kind of big and bushy and also similar to a peace lily they like lower light or they can survive in lower light um Another thing I love about this one is there are tons of variations. There's tons of different varieties that have different variegations. So you can all I pretty much have gotten to the point now that all of my little low light corners or low light pockets, I'm like, okay, I need to get a new Chinese evergreen, a different cultivar than I already have, and stick it in that spot. I like I like plants that have a lot of variety because mm -hmm. like I mean it kind of reminds me of like a coleus. Like they're another kind of leafy plant, but they're just so mm -hmm. there's it's just so fun when there's so many different kinds. You can really pick one that fits your space, that you like the best. When it helps to know the care, I'm sure, you know, if you look at all the different cultivars, there are different variations of how you would care for them. But in general, it's nice to know. It's nice to have one type of plant that you know how to take care of that can look really different. So it looks like you have all different kinds of plants, but really at the end of the day, you know that half of those all come from the same family. So you know you need to water them around the same time. They need around the same care. Exactly. It, it just helps keeping track of all of those little corners and pockets where you may not get as much light. Exactly. So this next section, we're going to talk about some money-saving tips or some things that people try to say that you should buy that you need for your plants that maybe not be the case or that might not be the case. The first big one, which we've kind of already talked about, but propagation and propagation, propagation. Like if you want to grow mm -hmm. your collection, propagate. That is the cheapest way. Not only can you, you know, take cuttings of your own plants, but if you have friends that have some plants, you know, you all could trade cuttings. If you go to a store and you see a bunch of succulent leaves on the floor, on the ground, you know, you could always ask them, hey, is it okay if I take these leaves on the ground? And if they say yes, you know, that's, you could propagate those and have succulents of your own. And that way you don't have to buy the actual whole plant if you don't want to. It's just a cheap way to do it. Can you clarify, just in case I am a beginner and I don't know, what it, what do you, when you say propagation, what is that? I don't understand. I'm sorry. Yes. So when I say propagation, I just mean, you know, Taking from one plant and starting another. So that could mean, so for like a vine like a pothos, that would mean cutting it by those aerial nodes or by those aerial roots uh, and putting it in water and it'll start to form roots on its own. And once it has a bunch of roots, you can plop it in some soil and it'll start to grow like a normal plant. Uh, for a succulent, a lot of times what you can do to propagate them is you can take the leaves off of the plant and the leaves themselves will actually start to grow roots and will start to grow um, stems and leaves and become a whole other succulent plant. So that's kind of what I mean. 
It's basically taking off of an already existing established plant and starting a new one. Perfect. And there are different propagation methods out there, tons of different ways. You don't have to always do it in water. Like Tate For said, sure. succulents, you definitely... I've seen tons of videos where people have done experiments with succulents and propagating them in water. And I've seen some successful propagations, but I wouldn't recommend it. Typically, the best way to propagate those is going to look different than your pothos or your foliage house plant. Right, exactly. Um, and even for the foliage houseplants, there's tons of propagation methods within that. So you can do the water propagation. You can do sphagnum moss. You can do straight into soil. I've seen recently a lot of people have been doing just plain perlite, just a whole bunch of perlite. That's interesting. Uh, Lekka is a great propagation medium, too, just because it gives the roots a little more space to grow. Um, and they end up being thicker and stronger sometimes, pushing through those clay balls. Yeah. So I've heard... Um, so it's not just sticking it in water. That's not necessarily the only way, but that is definitely the most common way, at least for us, that we use. Right. And and honestly, propagation could have a whole episode on its own. And I'm sure we'll talk about it in more detail because there are, like Tieran said, so many different ways you could propagate, especially for different plants. Because, you know, succulents aren't going to like a whole lot of water, but, you know, a, a tropical vine will like a whole lot of water. But um we just wanted to like introduce the topic to you guys. Okay, the next big one, I feel like one of the biggest expenses for me, again, I know we've talked about I'm a very aesthetic driven. I like the look of things. How things look is very important to me in my house. And so buying pots is so expensive that can add up really fast. And then obviously your plants grow and change sizes. And the bigger the pots, the more money you have to spend. So just some ways that you can, we just want to give you things to consider. I'm sure there are tons of other ideas out there, but something I've definitely gotten a little more creative with as time goes on and I can't afford to buy brand new pots for every single plant that I end up accumulating. Um, decorative storage baskets. I'm sure you've all seen the beautiful giant fig tree, fiddle leaf fig tree or monstera sitting in a decorative storage basket. Those are super cheap, especially if you go places like Ross, TJ Maxx, those types Goodwill. of stores. But mm -hmm. I mean, even like thrifting it. Right. But even like Ikea has them. Target yep. has them. I mean, you can find those kinds of baskets anywhere in all different sizes um, and in all different looks. So you can really pick the vibe you're going for or the style that you have going on in whatever space you're going to fill that plant. Um, you just stick your drainage tray down in the bottom and then you can just stick the nursery pot with the plant in it straight in the basket. And it totally adds a different look and a different texture than even some of your potted plants that are in your ceramic or whatever kind of pot. Another thing you can do, there are one trillion different ideas on how you can paint a plain terracotta pot. So of pots, you know, aside from plastic pots, terracotta is probably the next cheapest thing. Um, but not everybody loves the orange look. It may not go with your decor or your vibe, whatever it is. So painting terracotta, you can go something classic like just spray painting it a solid color. There's all kinds of different cool ideas out there. And that's definitely an easy way to switch up the vibe and the look of that vessel on a budget next one so yeah for this next one uh propagation vessels so when you are going to propagate your plant you could also you could always uh recycle some glass containers from the kitchen or from anything that you're using a lot of times when i'm propagating plants i just use any like jar or glass container that i have used for cooking at some point it's a good part it's good to recycle them and a lot of times they are pretty cute i mean Taryn's more uh, picky about, like, the aesthetic. If you're more practical and you don't want to spend a lot of money on, you know, glass containers and stuff, it's always good to recycle. You could even recycle, like, aluminum cans if you're really stripped for money. Because uh, at the end of the day, when you're just propagating a plant in water, most of the times the plant doesn't really care what it's in. I mean, as long as it's not, you know, in something that can kill it. Like, I mean, I'm trying to think of something. Can you think of anything that would, like, kill a plant while you're propagating it? Like a container? I don't think so. I wonder, though, what, like, if you use an aluminum can, does that mess with the pH, do you think, of water? Would that mess it up or no? Um, I mean, I wouldn't know. I don't think so. But maybe. Yeah. Maybe we'll do an experiment one day and yeah. find out. We should try to <laughs> test it out. Well, 
And definitely, I've I've never went and bought anything glass to propagate in, but you do if you start opening your eyes and paying attention to what you're throwing away in general. Let's all be more sustainable. Tate could give you a whole lecture on it, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and it's important. I don't mean to say it's not important, but I'm just sure we could get into a whole thing about how important it is that we uh, save our planet so that we can continue to grow plants. Haha. <laughs> yep. Anyways. You get really good at identifying the containers, the glass containers that you're like, ooh, I'm going to buy this uh, red curry paste instead of that red curry paste because I like this container better. And Kyle (laughs) gives me such a hard time. Like, we're at the point now. Any glass, anything I see, or even plastic, honestly, I've uh, recently used up a whole thing of ibuprofen. (laughs) That's what teaching will do to you. Yeah. And um, (laughs) or 2020 in general. Or teaching in 2020. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways. even plastic containers that are cute shapes you can totally use. Nobody would ever know they're plastic and not glass as long as you, you know, st- stick yeah, it in exactly. a cute spot. And all the things we said about terracotta is like painting them and customizing them. Like that could, you could also do that with any like glass containers or anything. And that's, that's kind of what's fun about it. You can get real creative, you know, like add your own style to cer- certain things. And you'll reuse that stuff. When that plant dies or when you're ready to pot that cutting, then you have it. I have a huge under my kitchen sink is like propagation station storage. <laughs> There's yep. tons of for me, it's like uh, tons of shot glasses that have turned into cutting or propagation vessels. <laughs> Every ooh, one of my favorites is uh, little liquor bottles, you know, your airplane liquor bottles or whatever. Once you ooh, take that shot, use those. Sometimes yeah. it's hard to get the roots out, just throwing it out there, but. They're super cute. I have, like, the cutest little Jaeger bottle with the Hoya cutting by all my little perfumes in the bathroom, and it's cute and tiny. Tiny stuff is always cute. Yep. I know. I have some cuttings that definitely need to be potted, but they just look so cute in the jars. Like, I don't... I'm almost just going to keep them there for a while. Another idea that I have dabbled with a little bit, and once, you know, we're past this time of life where shopping isn't as easy, once we can go thrifting again a little more easily... Um, upcycling kitchen containers. So I am a sucker for putting plants in mugs. I just think it's cute. Always. Uh, other ideas, looking for old vintage ice cream bowls, pitchers, gravy boats, tea kettles, just any kind of cute kitcheny vessel that you can find of any material, really. Um, those are easy things that can add a look and give a definite vibe or add to your vibe without it being necessarily for plants and not being like fifty dollars for exactly. just one pot <laughs> what about macrame i know somebody has been getting into macrame lately yes i've been macrame my life away over here <laughs> so that's an idea you can make some kind of uh just pot covers and again that would be easy you can put any um plant in them just make Uh, either out of yarn or macrame or anything like that you can make a cover and then slip it over the nursery pot that's an easy way to hide the nursery pot and then not have to have a container another idea or thing i've done in the past is trash cans (laughs) like small bathroom trash cans or trash bins i guess you could say um you can spray paint them honestly i found a couple just black ones from ikea and they are for bigger plants, which, again, are the harder ones to find pots for. So instead of spending $50 on a pretty ceramic pot, I just have a black trash bin. It's black, you can't really tell, and it's bigger, so I just have other smaller plants layered in front of that black. (laughs) So you can't really see it, and it just gives a solid background. So that's Well, when you you have a good, like, pretty plant in there, who's really looking at the pot? When it's, like, a black one, you know, it it looks good. It's simple. Yeah. Solid colors are great, but you could yeah. even, something I wanted to try is getting the metallic spray paint, see if that Ooh. looks good or bad. That so would that, cool. It's still a solid, but cool. it adds a pop. So yeah. those are just some ideas on how, t- I feel like one of the most expensive things, at least for me, is the what you're going to put the plants in. So those are a great way, and even if you have to stick with your nursery pots, a great way to keep aesthetics in mind or keep the look in mind is... Just as you're accumulating nursery pots by either putting plants in their, you know, at home forever pots or they're dying, whatever it is, save your nursery pots, wash them, organize them by color and size, and then you can either group them, you know, 
all the same thing or if you want to switch it up. I want a square black one and a circle black one and then a bigger square black pot. You know, whatever it is, you can still use those if you take all the stickers and wash them and make them look all nice and new. You can definitely use those in a way. It gives you at least a more finished look than hodgepodge, random all kinds of stuff. So even if you do have to stick with your nursery pots, right. there's definitely ways that you can use those. Because like Tate said, understated is honestly almost always good in a pot. You want the focus to be on the foliage and not on the pot necessarily. Another thing, if you're starting off on a budget, obviously starting small as far as plant size goes, it's much cheaper to buy a two inch pot of string of hearts than it is to buy a well-established 10 inch pot hanging pot of string of hearts oh yeah so obviously especially if it's a certain type of plant you've never had before and you want to make sure you can keep it alive first starting small is a great way to not have your plant die on you but also it will grow bigger so if you can get successful and over time as you're learning how to take care of it it's going to grow bigger and bigger obviously and then you will eventually get there but that obviously takes patience and time but that's what being on a budget is really in life (laughs) yep And it's also so satisfying, too. Like, if you can get it to grow that big, it's it's honestly so rewarding being like, yep, I raised that little baby to this big, beautiful plant. Yeah. And it was five (laughs) dollars. Yeah. So keep in mind for all these things we're talking about, drainage is still really important. So if you're going to buy something that may not have a drainage hole, you are going to want to think about how you're going to get drainage in that plant. So... Uh, but there are some specific like drill bits you can buy if you have a drill so you can drill holes in them. I know like for ceramic, I think it's um, a diamond mm-hmm. tip drill bit or something like that. Um, and that that way you can drill holes in, in some ceramic containers. But also, if you don't want to mess with the containers themselves, we kind of mentioned this before, but you could just keep those nursery pots that you already had and put them in the containers themselves. So that way the uh, pretty container that you bought can kind of act like the collecting tray. When you water the plant, then the vessel becomes the catch-all for the water. That becomes your drainage tray. So then you can just take the plant in its nursery pot out of the decorative vessel you have it in, whatever it is, dump the water, then stick the plant back in there. I also think that's a great way to, and it depends on what you have going on, but sometimes Adding a drainage tray throws off the look for me, especially if you went and just thrifted this super cute vintage pitcher. You don't really want to have a plastic or even ceramic terracotta tray underneath it. So a great way to avoid drilling a hole is just stick the plant in there and drain the water after. Something I think you can definitely save money on. I bought a moisture meter because obviously we've talked about I had I have watering issues and I still have (laughs) watering issues. And maybe it's because I cheaped out and just bought a relatively cheap moisture meter off Amazon, but honestly, it hasn't helped me figure out watering at all. I actually, eventually, after I'd tried using it for a while and didn't feel like it was working, I stuck it in water (laughs) to see how much moisture it would tell me when I stuck it in a glass of water, and it didn't even go all the way to the top. So I was like, okay, this is, this is dumb, which, you know, there might be some, if you want to splurge on a nice moisture meter, good for you, but again, sticking to our theme of saving money I don't think buying the moisture meter is worth it, honestly. Something that I think is good to invest in up front, I know we've talked about this. Yes, spend time right now figuring out how you can home make your pest repellent, um, especially as a prevention measure, because like we've said before, it is a lot harder to get rid of pests and a lot easier to prevent against them. Of course, if you have houseplants for a long time, you're going to have pests. That's just part of it. But prevention will save you so much time and money later. Money on the plants not dying from the pests. Uh, money on more intense and not as natural solutions to the pests. Um, so definitely investing a little bit of time and a little bit of money. You can get your 99 cent spray bottle from the store. All you need is a little bit of dish soap, uh, Castile soap is sometimes best, but honestly, dish soap works just fine. Whatever dish soap you have, I'm sure is great. And then um, adding a little bit of neem oil. It's spelt N-E-E-M, neem oil. Um, I am pretty sure the stuff I bought off Amazon, I know there's lots of different options out there. There's cold pressed, and you definitely want to get a decent quality because if you get real bad, if you super cheap out, then it may not work very well for you if it's not the right stuff. So you want to make sure you get 
decent neem oil, but you only put a teeny tiny bit in for that whole water bottle. So it'll last you a while. And it's just so worth it. Mm -hmm. Trust us. <laughs> yeah, it's it's worth it to not have fungus gnats flying around your whole Ugh. house. Learned the hard way. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay, what are your thoughts, Tate, on reusing soil? So, yeah, I mean, I reuse my soil. I know that's kind of, that can be controversial sometimes, but I just reuse it. I, when, if I have a plant die or if I just have soil, I usually put it all together in like a big bag or a big like plastic bin <clears throat> and uh, we'll kind of mix it up. I'll, sometimes I'll add some like worm castings or a little bit of fertilizer to kind of revitalize it mm. because a lot of the soil can be pretty old, but I would recommend reusing soil so you're not having to buy a bunch all the time. But you, if, especially re if you're trying to save money. You put the nutrients in, though, you said. Like, you add Yes, I do. I do put more nutrients back in because a lot of times the soil that I use can sit there for a while not being used, and it just kind of loses. Like, the fertilizer does have a time limit because a lot of the soil that I use is the pre-packaged, pre-mixed soil mix, and so that comes with some fertilizers. But I think over time, those fertilizers kind of lose their punch you know so i do put some a little bit i don't go overboard because if you go overboard it can be too much but i just mix a little bit of fertilizer back in there when i'm planting the plant usually well i guess my question what i'm talking about is not reusing soil out of a bag because it's not reusing i'm talking about your plant died no, no no when i say i'm sorry when i say bag it's just like the bag that i use to put all my soil in gotcha you're you know mixing I mean? bag like it's just yeah, my mixing bag. Got it, it's got it, not got it. like the prepackaged bag. It's just like the bag that I honestly, it's a recycled litter cat litter bag, <laughs> but it has, it's really big. It's huge. So I can just put all my soil in there. And then I also use like a little plastic tub. Gotcha. But yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's, that's my, what I wanted to point out. I have got moved away from use, reusing soil. Again, I've been dealing with the fungus gnats and they can basically, the thing that's risky about reusing soil is pests can linger in the soil. You don't want, if, especially if your plant died because of pests, you do not want to reuse that soil because Ooh, the yeah, pests are going to be in the soil. And even if you have, you know, you say you have a plant for a couple years, it's time to repot it. Part of the reason it's time to repot it is because of size, but also part of the reason is because the nutrients are organic and they get eaten up. So the, the plant will soak, soak up all the nutrients and then that soil will now just be basically dirt and not have the nutrients and organic matter that the plant needs. So that's just another thing to keep in mind. If it's if you've had a plant in that soil for a long time, um, you can use it. If you're cutting it like Tate does, how she mixes it in with some other newer stuff, you can definitely refresh it. But that's just something else to keep in mind. It's not a finite amount of nutrients in there it is wait it is a finite amount of nutrients it is a finite it's not infinite <laughs> double negative yeah. oh i've also seen there's ways you can if you want to reuse your soil there are definitely ways you can clean sterilize it i guess i don't know if sterilize is the right word you can clean it sterilize it refresh it and make sure there's no pests or anything in there um i i feel like i've seen i don't know something about cooking it <laughs> i've also seen something oh, wow. about um maybe a, i want to say like a hydrogen peroxide mix that you can drain through it and that'll kill stuff so there's definitely ways that you can refresh right. stuff if you if you are reusing but there are just some risks involved so i just wanted to throw that out there right so like it's it's a good idea to reuse your soil but again like taryn said if you have any pests in there if you have like a lot of fungus or something it's probably not a good idea couple other just quick little notes off the end here, going off of that soil conversation we were just having, um, getting soil additives. So if you just use plain old like miracle Grow or whatever, any brand, brand doesn't really matter, hashtag not sponsored. I mean, unless... <laughs> I mean, unless... Grow, unless you want to sponsor us, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> They're probably like, no. Um, <laughs> if you're going to use just the plain plain Jane potting mix. It does not always have a whole lot of aeration in the soil. Um, so when I say soil additives, things we've talked about in the past, adding the perlite or the sand or whatever it is so that the water can drain all the way through and the roots don't rot. Um, I would say as far as are those really necessary? I would say yes. 
I think it's, again, my problem is overwatering, so I almost can't even use plain old soil mix because I it, it holds too much moisture for me. So it kind of depends, obviously, on your habits and what the plants need, but if you are an overwaterer, if that's an issue and that's something you've lost plants to in the past, I would definitely invest just a little bit of money in either the cactus and succulent soil. You can use that to cut, so do half of the normal soil and half of the cactus soil. Or other additives such as perlite, sand, pumice, orchid bark, etc. Getting even just a little bit of that and put mixing that in with your soil will go a really long way with the drainage and aeration of those roots. And it will help keep those things alive. So obviously do your research on what the plant is, what the plant needs, knowing yourself. Yeah, I think it's funny you say that because I honestly, like, I'll use the pre-made, like, miracle Grow potting soil and be, and honestly, it's usually pretty okay, but I do know that I don't, I don't tend to overwater as much. Like, I probably tend to underwater more than overwater. Mm-hmm. So, like, for me, that might if work. And if, like, you're out there and you tend to underwater, <clears throat> just know that the premixed soil can usually tend to hold a lot of moisture. So that can be good for some people, but it could also be bad for some people, too. And I will say this. If you're truly a beginner and you have no idea... Then just start with the regular soil and see how it goes. <laughs> it, it's exactly. Not, it's totally okay if you are not sure if you're an underwater or an overwater. Oh my gosh, overwater or or if you don't know what the plant needs. I mean, it's it's really at the end of the day you got to start somewhere. And I would definitely suggest not. I'm I have a bad habit in life when I start doing something. I really I'm like okay, I need all the stuff so I can get set up and do it right because <laughs> I don't like being goes bad at all it. in. Yes. And then I buy a one year subscription to something that I only used for one month because I ended up not even doing it or whatever. That's a random example. But you know what I'm saying. So if you're not really sure, then I would say just buy the plain old potty mix, whatever. See how it goes. Yeah, exactly. If you're a beginner, just get some soil. You know, if it's a cactus, get the cactus soil. If it's a house plant, you could probably just use like the normal potting mix soil and see what happens. I would also say yes to gardening gloves. It just keeps things a little bit cleaner. I use mine all of the time. It's it's not necessary unless I don't I mean, I am always fearful some bug is going to jump out and bite me from the dirt and so I'm a I have to have gloves on almost cuz I'm just a diva like that, but they're not necessarily necessary. And then shears, same kind of thing. I use mine all the time, but you could use scissors you have or just a sharp knife that you have to cut anything off a plant that you would need. So just know too, like for a plant, it's generally better to have like a, a clean cut when you're cutting it. It's not really good to like leave a lot of um, like if you're just like ripping a stem off, it's usually worse for the plant. So that's why like the shears are important because those will give you like a clean cut and that's best for the plant to heal and then best for your cutting as well. And then as far as fertilizer goes... Yes, eventually you're going to need it and you're going to need to figure out how to use it and what kind works best for what you've got going on. Uh, But I would say if you're just getting started right off the bat, you probably don't need to worry about it too much yet because kind of like we said, whatever soil you put your plant in, whatever medium you put your plant in will have some nutrients. And so it's especially once we get closer to the growing season, once things warm up more and we have more sun during the day that's when the fertilizer becomes more important and I know there's tons of people that continue to fertilize even in the non-growing season in the winter time which is what we're in right now Uh, but I would just honestly I haven't spent a whole lot of my time fertilizing just yet that's something I'm still trying to figure out so I would say don't worry too much right now if you're first starting off with fertilizer and buying different kinds of fertilizer yeah and agreed like Taryn said it's probably more important in the growing season because fertilizer, it's basically plant food. It's what they need to grow. And so if they don't really have that, they're not really going to grow a whole lot. Um, But if you buy like the potting mix, it usually comes with fertilizer in it. And it usually says on the bag how long it'll last. Okay. I hate to say this, but my biggest and best tip overall, something I would go back to tell myself, even though I know I wouldn't have listened anyway, is starting small and manageable. Most of my plant deaths, I would say, are because I didn't research the plant at all before buying it, or I just got ahead of myself in how to take care of it. Like, I looked it up and was like, okay, it's going to need these things, but I just didn't have the time or kind of forgot or whatever it was, and I've spent the money on it, and then they just crash and burn so fast. Again, like my Calathea White Fusion, I 
that was such a joke. Honestly, even when it came in the mail, I was like, what am I doing, girl? So <laughs> I would say in general to specific plants, but also overall when you're approaching your collection, you want to really try to cherish everything you get. It's really easy to start buying and buying and buying and buying. And I'm definitely not telling you not to do that because, hey, I did it. But just be ready for when you buy more rapidly if you're not putting in equal amount of effort and work which we all try and life gets in the way sometimes. That's one of the biggest things that I think has led to some of my deaths. It's not necessarily, you know, of course it's because of care at the end of the day, but it's really because I didn't ahead of time do the research and put into it what I Prepare. needed to. Yes. And so it was just kind of on a whim. And then here we are. I don't have that beautiful, gorgeous plant that I bought at whatever Yeah, that point. is the worst feeling is when you're, you get the plant and you take it home and you're like, all right, what do I need? You like look after the fact, like, what do I need to take care of it? And then you see all the things that it needs and you're like, oh, oh. why did I do that? Why did I buy this that, plant? For me, that was the alocasia poly that I bought because I bought that pretty, <laughs> I would say, earlier in the quarantine life. I would say probably April, May time frame. And I just yeah. was buying plants online and it. I saw that it needed high humidity, but I was like, okay, sure. I'll figure it out. And I bought it. And obviously, I was nowhere near prepared to take care of it because it's needy. So just <laughs> being aware. That's yep. helpful. Okay, guys. What did we miss? What tips do you have? I'm sure there are tons of other ideas y'all have out there and your experience and ways you can save. I'm sure you have different opinions than what we have said today, and we would love to hear them. Um, I think we all need some help recuperating our funds after the holidays always. So if you have any yep. money-saving tips, we would love to hear them. Speaking of holidays, it's almost Christmas, which is the holiday we celebrate at this time of year. If you don't celebrate Christmas awesome we love all the holidays so we are going to do a special plant exchange episode whoop, whoop. so we are going to be sharing some plant cuttings and plants with each other yes. we aren't going to do any wrapping because who cares no one's going to see it that's the point of a podcast you can't see haha <laughs> so join us <laughs> for our next episode as we start toasting the end of 2020 and do a fun Hallelujah. yes bring on 2021 i'm so ready so join us as oh, yeah. we do our plant exchange celebrate the holidays cheers to the end of 2020 next episode remember you can follow us on instagram and twitter at plant that sis our website is plantthatsis.com and if you really want to email us oh my gosh we'd love to hear from you plantthatsis at gmail.com thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time Okay, bye. Bye.